It's Friday the 4th of February 2022 and this is Model Steam Engines for Beginners Part 20, a special feature, valve gear of the steam railway locomotive. Here are some clips from a video I made quite a long while back and here you see a 9F210 and this looks suspiciously like a Black 5. And here it is going the other way. The thing they have in common is the valve gear. These locomotives have valve shafts valve gear. This small Great Western Railway pannier tank has Stevenson's link valve gear, which is internal. And here's a Great Western Railway prairie tank, and the valve gear on this is also inside the frames. The Great Western Railway engines were really good machines and led the way in design. The most common valve gear though is valve shafts. It's all external and much easier to service. All of these clips show what could be called modern locomotives and in a previous video I showed this locomotive. This one is definitely the most modern because it's a replica. The original was built in 1813 to 1814. It's called Puffing Billy and this is the one that is at Beamish Museum. And as I also mentioned previously, this is two grasshopper beam engines driving a central axle. Before steam locomotives could progress, technology needed to advance the technology of boilers to allow higher working pressures and the revolutionary addition of the blast pipe where the exhaust goes up the chimney to draw the fire. This engine doesn't have a blast pipe. Stevenson fitted the first blast pipe as far as I'm aware to Stevenson's rocket. That was the locomotive that won the Rainhill Trials. The original Stevenson's rocket was built in 1829 and what remains of it is in the Science Museum in London. This is also a replica and it's much smaller. It's a 5 inch gauge model of a Stevenson's rocket. This is part of my collection and I have it in a glass case in the kitchen. Here's an extract from a video that I made a while ago. When I first bought this beautiful model from Simon Hudson at the Steam Workshop, I was puzzled by this thing at the front. And all it is, is a large cast iron weight, and you fit this to the engine if you want to run it. The sole purpose of this cast iron weight, apart from having a couple of sort of rudimentary buffers on the front, is to put weight over the front wheels. And then the very small locomotive is capable of pulling a person around a track. The engine still rocks from side to side slightly, but when I watched a video of a full-size replica of a Stevenson's rocket going down the track, that was also rocking from side to side very slightly. The main thing is, though, it's a beautiful little model as this. And I spent quite a lot of time obsessing over the position of the valve gear, and as you can see, look how slowly it will run. There aren't a lot of engines that will run this slowly. Setting the valve gear on this locomotive was a bit of a trial and error operation. And when I think about it, it took about four hours over a period of intermittent tweaking of the valve gear to get it to run like this, but I think it's worth it. The original Stevenson's rocket, as far as I'm aware, used some valve gear called Gab valve gear. Similarly to the old beam engines, this type of valve gear allowed it to be moved by hand. But the levers that are fitted to the valve gear on this model are for decoration purposes only. The valve gear fitted to this engine uses two eccentrics and it's called slip eccentric. A lever that you press on the foot plate selects either one eccentric or the other. And once the eccentric has been selected, you have to roll the engine forward or reverse depending which way you want to go. It's a very simple solution and it works quite well on models. It wouldn't be too good using it on a full size locomotive though. For two reasons, the first one being obviously these things in the full size are very heavy, so it would be very difficult for the driver and fireman to get out of the engine and push it forward or backwards relative to which eccentric had been selected. And the other problem with slip eccentric valve gear is you cannot notch it up, which means you can't wind the reverser towards reverse so the engine uses less steam. Another engine in my collection, and this is one of my personal favourites, is the Lion. The original Lion locomotive was built in 1838 in Leeds, and it's currently in a museum in Liverpool. It was used in the film The Titfield Thunderbolt, and it was actually damaged during the making of the film. I'd like to show you how it works underneath, so I'm very carefully tipping it over on its side on the kitchen table. 
or should I say, onto some very thick bubble wrap on the kitchen table. And this is what's underneath, quite a lot. It doesn't look very complicated from the outside, but inside it's a different story. I'll take some time to show what all the parts are and explain what they do. First of all though, I've removed some of the oil and grime using a paper towel. The first thing to have a look at is the main crank axle. This is a very important component. The slip eccentric valve gear is also fitted to the crank axle. More about this shortly. The eccentric rods connect the two eccentrics to the two valves in the steam chest. And there's a right piston crosshead and a left piston crosshead. And at the top of the picture is a crosshead driven water pump. This will pump water into the boiler when it's running. The amount of water that's pumped into the boiler can be regulated by a water bypass valve, which if opened returns the water to the tank instead of pumping it into the boiler. At the front of course is the cylinder block. I'll try and explain how slip eccentric works. Both of the eccentric sheaves are not fixed to the axle. They can rotate around the axle, as I'm showing here. Each of the eccentric sheaves is fitted with a peg, and there are two adjustable steel quadrants which stop the eccentric sheave from moving too far around the axle. The position of each of these quadrants, one for forward and one for reverse, control the slide valve events in the steam chest to both admit and exhaust the steam. Slip eccentric valve gear is very simple and very easy to make. Here's the lion in steam on the bench. I'm going to stop speaking for a while and just let you watch it in steam. I made a series that was 105 episodes long about rebuilding a simplex locomotive. Here are some excerpts from that series. The first part of any steam test is to fill the boiler with water, so I'm actually using the axle pump, driving the engine with compressed air, and it's filling the boiler very well, a little bit too well. The heat source for this test is this small portable gas burner. It's actually quite good. It's very important to oil every moving part, including the axle boxes. Quite a few years ago, I made this. It's a sweet pea locomotive, but it's not what it seems. I modified it and stretched it to fit on my seven and a quarter inch gauge railway line around my previous house. I didn't stretch the frames, they're the same. I just used longer axle boxes and basically extended everything by one inch outside the frames, including the cylinders. I even fitted a Southworth Engines steam-powered water pump to it. This locomotive has a different type of valve gear to the others. It's called Hackworth valve gear. It's quite simple to make, and it works very well indeed. Drawings and parts to build the Sweet Pea locomotive are available from Blackgates Engineering as well as the Southworth Engines range of excellent steam pumps. I used to drive this engine around my garden railway. The only problem with it that I found was it didn't have a superheater, and it used a lot more water than my 7.25 inch gauge Titch did. That, of course, had a superheater fitted. Because this engine was running on wet steam, it felt completely different, and I ran it for a while and then I sold it. Why did I sell it? Well, I needed the money. Raising my family in a large house with a railway around it took some doing. I don't mean the railway, I mean the family. At one time I used the garden railway quite a lot, but then the novelty wore off. This video clip you're about to see was taken quite a few years later, with my friend Alexander Carnes driving. When I built this locomotive, I didn't want to have to keep rebuilding the valve gear and I found some ball racers which were a quarter of an inch OD and one eighth of an inch ID and I fitted these to all of the moving links on the valve gear. And now in 2020 there's very little in the way of wear on the motion. There is some wear on the coupling rod and connecting rod bushes but not a lot as you can hear the engine runs very sweetly. I really thought it out when I built this engine. For instance, I made sure that the expansion link was large, therefore it wouldn't wear out very quickly. Also, the engine axle boxes contained ball racers, 
These are shrouded and shielded and have never got any dirt in them so they still run very freely indeed. I used to drive it flat out down this part of the railway. When I first built the railway I incorporated a reverse curve at the end of this long straight in case the engine ever did derail, in which case it would tip itself and all the passengers onto the lawn, not onto the gravel and up against the stone wall. And finally, in this excerpt from a simplex prairie tank, I show what each of the many parts of the valve gear are called. And after that, I show the first steam test. I would just like to say stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. At this moment in time, there's still quite a lot of work to do to finish this job. I thought I would quickly do a little feature on valve gear parts. I am actually tempted to sing this, but I'm no singer, so I'll give that a miss. Here we go. The return crank is connected to the eccentric rod. The eccentric rod is connected to the expansion link. The expansion link is connected to the radius rod. And the radius rod is connected to the combination lever. And the combination lever is connected to the anchor link. And the radius rod is moved up and down by the lifting arm. This selects forward gear or reverse gear. I haven't fitted the reversing lever and the reach rod yet, but when I do, that will connect to the reversing arm. As I mentioned, when the engine is finished, I will probably do a detailed explanation on the way Valshout's valve gear works, but not for the moment, I'm only halfway through the job. And just in case any viewers can't wait for my explanation, there are much better explanations online. Please Google Valshout's valve gear. I'll put the spelling on screen. The steam pressure showing on the pressure gauge is only about 40 pounds per square inch. And although the engine's running very well on the test bed, this pressure would be at the bottom of the range for successfully pulling passengers. Considering the state of this engine when I first got it, I really am quite pleased with the way it's running. There are still one or two minor tweaks that need doing, but nothing severe. I'm not happy with the return crank, it's not tight enough on the crank pin. But the engine doesn't know this, so it runs anyway. The water levels dropped slightly in the water gauge, so I'm closing the bypass valve. Here I'm demonstrating the cylinder drains. When I open them, just steam comes out. Now the engine's running, the exhaust blasting up the chimney is drawing the fire through the tubes. So the steam to the cylinders looks very dry now. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.